This is Anona's Worship, Grow, Serve, Live podcast for October 8th, 2023. If, part two, as if, with Casey McKinney. This is one of our sermon series episodes produced by Anona United Methodist Church. For more information and video versions, visit anona.com forward slash sermon series. If you're new to Anona and wish to learn more about our community, go to anona.com forward slash welcome. And now for another great message. I've told you guys before that I have lived here since I was 13, and I have kind of grown up with the same group of best friends since then. Me and Agagla girls met each other in eighth grade. Some girls met before that. But regardless, we just met each other and just decided, that's it. We're just done. These are our friends for the rest of our lives. And it's wonderful. And one of my favorite things about that is that now in our 30s, I was just, I spent the weekend with two of my best friends. And one evening, Molly and I, she's the one who has the three kids that I'm obsessed with, we took her kids to the pumpkin patch and the park, and we were just having the best time, and it just allows me to reminisce on all of the memories that we've had to get us to this point. And so Molly and I were not always the very responsible 30-something-year-olds that are in charge of children now. We were once very irresponsible, maybe not very, we were pretty decent, but we were your average teenager, which means we had a few stories, one of which happened after school one day. We were in junior year of high school. Molly and I rode to and from school together every day. We went to Osceola High. Anyone else? Osceola alumni? Fine. Great. Whatever. Yeah, me either. No big deal. Seminole, Largo, whatever. Oh, Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, well, whatever. I went to Osceola High School. I guess it wasn't that cool to do. But we went to Osceola, so we got out of school one day. We're in our junior year. And Molly had been gifted a hand-me-down from her mom, a Chrysler Sebring convertible. Anyone remember those cars? I don't know. Do they even make them anymore? I don't think so, which is super funny because if you were here last Sunday, Richard was telling a story about a really old car that he had and back in the day, and he was talking about it like it was this really cool car. And I'm sitting over here thinking like, I don't even know what car that is, Richard. They don't even make that anymore. And then now here I am and I'm like, man, I don't even make this car anymore. So taste my own medicine. So anywho, we're in, it was bright blue. It was beautiful. We would have the top down all the time. We thought we were the coolest thing, like 16 and 17 years old. Our thing was to listen to the Spice Girls Greatest Hit CD. It was our favorite. We had different parts of songs that each one of us was required to sing. Like you would come in at this beat, you would come in at this beat, and like you knew your parts. Uh, Very serious business. So we just thought we were the coolest things, right? So we leave high school one day. We had to take these two ninth grade boys home as a favor to their parents. So we pull out of the school, and we've got these two kids in the back, and we're listening to Spice Girls. And I'm looking out the passenger side window, just like hair in the wind, like, you know, the invincible teenager feeling where you're like, life is amazing and nothing bad could ever happen. It's just, there's something so magical about being a teenager at times. And I'm looking out the window and all of a sudden, I just feel this force come from the front of the car. Just pressure and I hear tires screeching and I smell burning rubber and I whip back and forth. My, I'm sitting up, and so my head goes forward and back and forward again. And so I'm facing the dashboard, and I have no idea what just happened. I'd never been in a car wreck before. And I hear all of this stuff, and I smell all of this stuff, and I'm feeling all of this pressure coming towards me. And everything kind of starts to settle down, and I hear the two boys in the back seat freaking out because they're like 13, 14-year-old boys, whatever, losing their minds. And I realize we've been in a car accident, and I don't hear anything from Molly. My head, I'm going back and forth, back and forth, my face. So all I'm looking at is like my feet in the dash, and I realize I don't hear Molly. I can hear everything else but not her. So I'm super scared to turn over and look towards the driver's seat because I don't know what I'm going to see. I don't know what's going to happen. So I finally get up to courage to slowly pick my head up and turn over to the driver's seat. And all I see is Molly, white knuckling the steering wheel, jaw on the floor, eyes as wide as saucers, white in the face, looking at what's just happened. We're speechless because Molly had just hit the car in front of us. And now, thank goodness, everyone was okay. But if you've ever gotten in a car accident as a teenager, you know there's that moment where you kind of wish you were hurt instead of the car. (laughs) 
It was one of those moments where we were like, this might have gone better for us if it was us and not the car. So we get out of the car and we start looking at the damages and we'd hit the car in front of us. You know, thank God everyone's totally okay. Nobody's hurt. But Molly's just yelling, my paint job, my paint job, my paint job, because her dad had literally just paid to get a new paint job on that car. And then we crashed it like five minutes later, right? So Molly is freaking out. She knows she has to call her dad. She knows we're about to get in trouble. Calls her dad. Dad's on the way. I'm not calling my parents yet because I'm like, not my car. Like, I'm, I'm going I'm to sit this one out. So she calls her dad. She knows everything's a mess. She's losing it. She's freaking out. And so I decide I'm going to overcompensate with positivity. Like, I'm going to try and help like, this is bad, but, like, we're going to get through it. So I just start spewing out random things. I'm probably in shock. Anything I can think of. I'm like, Molly, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We're going to fix it. I kept saying that over and over. It was like I got stuck on it. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. Finally, Molly, my best friend, just saw her two days ago. We love each other so much. Soul sisters. She looks at me and with all of the frustration says, Casey, we are not going to fix this. In fairness, she was correct, actually, facts. But I was also a little bit right, too, because everything was okay in the end. We lived to tell the tale. We're still all right. We got ungrounded eventually. It was okay. The car did get fixed. We didn't fix it. We didn't fix it, but it got fixed. Someone fixed the car. Everything did end up okay. I was partially right with my positivity in that moment, but it didn't change that it wasn't what Molly needed. In that moment, she actually did not need me to fix it. She did not need me to try and make it better. She did not need me to try and spin this in some kind of positive way. She just needed me to sit with her while we waited for her dad to come. She just needed me to be there. She needed me to just let this be bad and let this be hard. Friends, we're in this sermon series on this book by an author named Mark Batterson, and the book is called If. And it goes through Romans chapter 8 and addresses different if statements that the author kind of picks out from Romans chapter 8. Um, very inspiring, very positive, very hopeful guy. And this week is, last week if you were here, you saw Richard, and he preached on oh, If Only. If only. And he talked about the regrets in our lives. And so this week, we're taking a look at the phrase, as if. And Mark Batterson is looking at more texts from chapter 8, and he's trying to talk about all that life could be. He's talking about the future glory that we have with God, the hope, how Scripture is so full of promises from God, and all of this stuff. This is a few of the quotes from this section of the book. Batterson says, I'm not lobbying for Pollyannism. I'm advocating for an optimism that is anchored to the thousands of what-if promises God has given us. I am admittedly a um, safe place. Don't tell anyone. I'm so cynical that I'm like, oh, did you count? Did you count? Are there thousands, Mark Batterson? Did you count them? Maybe that's just me. He says, count the thousands. What are the thousands of promises and live as if they are true? He says, pick a promise, any promise, and drop an anchor. Live as if you are who God says you are, even when you don't feel it. He says, when you are in trouble, take heart. He has overcome the world. When you're lonely, don't forget he'll never leave you or forsake you. When you feel like you've lost your way, remember he orders your footsteps. And finally, when you live as if everything is a miracle, you discover that miracles are all around you all the time. As I'm reading through this chapter, I felt like I'm back at that car wreck. And I feel like I am Molly and Mark Batterson is me. And I wanted to yell at him. See, it's not that I disagree with him. It's not that I think what he's saying isn't true. Like how at the car accident, I was partially right. Like everything was going to be fine. It's not that I think what he's saying isn't true. It's just that I feel like he's missing something. I want us to take a look at the scripture he's referencing. It's a pretty large chunk in Romans 8, so what I thought we could do is just read the first few verses and the last few verses to kind of bookend it, um, and we'll get the gist of it. So we're picking up in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 5. We're going to do verses 5 and 6, and then we're going to do 14 through 18 to kind of wrap it up. So this is the scripture that he's referencing with all of these lovely, hopeful, optimistic words. 
He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds. Well, this is Paul, not Mark Batterson. Let's be very clear. Paul says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. 14, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, and now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory of that will be revealed in us. A couple weeks ago, Jack preached a sermon about God's sovereignty. And he talked about trusting God and not losing faith, even in times of suffering. This goes hand in hand with this idea of as if. See, sometimes, I think in moments of suffering, we want to jump from that point of pain immediately into that point of hope. We just don't want to deal with it because it hurts and it's hard. I get it. Pain is pain. It hurts. We want to get in the car wreck and then immediately say, we're going to fix it. We want to skip the morning of the death and just get to the resurrection, which is a bit how this section of the book felt to me. It felt like it was so focused on all the sunshine in this passage while missing the context in which that encouragement is being given. See, Paul is always writing letters from jail cells or shipwrecks or to persecuted Christians who are literally running for their lives. There's, if you read in the book of Hebrews, there's this wild passage that talks about how people are getting sawed in two. Okay, that's real. That's the reality of the context that Paul is writing. Verse 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings, present sufferings, it's real, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Will be, but maybe not yet. It's this tension, it's this dance of not sacrificing seeing what is to try and see the as if. And if you ask me, I think that if we really want to get to the as if, if we really want to get to that future glory and that hope and that Mark Batterson sunshiny view of things, I really think the first step is facing what is. We can't skip the suffering just to get to the sunshiny part. In my recent years, I've become a pretty big fan of the liturgical calendar. Very nerdy sentence to say, I know. If you don't know what the liturgical calendar is, it's pretty much the church's way of framing the year based on events in the life and ministry of Christ. And it's really helpful for a person like me who I've had anxiety my whole life and the world is usually a pretty uncertain place for me in my brain. And so I like having something that is a bit bigger than myself that kind of frames things and gives me structure and grounding and a little bit of tradition. It just makes me feel connected and grounded a little bit. And so that means I really like days like Pentecost. I really like things like we're in ordinary time. It's just nice. I just like it. And because of all of that, one of my favorite days in Holy Week has become one that I've, the more I've paid attention to the church calendar, Holy Week is the week that leads up to Easter. And the more that I've paid attention to it, the more that my favorite day of Holy Week is actually not usually Easter, which I know is like clutch your pearls. Sorry, that's not the Christian answer to say. But my favorite day is one that's actually more often overlooked in Holy Week. And it's this day in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. This day in between Christ's death, when he's crucified and tortured and abandoned. In between that and when the dawn breaks and death is overcome and Christ is risen. There is a whole other day that we usually skip over. We don't really know what to do with it. We don't really acknowledge it. And it's Holy Saturday. It's this day in the church calendar, in the narrative of the resurrection, 
where nothing happens. Death just is. Grief just is. Pain is just there. The disciples have scattered. Jesus is gone. They had put all of their hope in this rabbi. They had trusted him that he was going to do all of these things and change all of these things. And then he died. And they didn't know that Easter was coming. See, we've got this really beautiful vantage point at our uh, position here reading these sacred texts and these stories because even in Holy Week, we always do a Maundy Thursday service that kind of, we kind of combine Maundy Thursday, the Last Supper and the arrest of Jesus with a Good Friday service where he dies and is crucified. We kind of combine those things and we do that every year. And it's one, it's probably my favorite church service of the whole year because to me, it feels so real. I was talking to someone after early service about it. It feels so real and so raw and so vulnerable and, and I connect with it so much. Um, we, we do that. We acknowledge that. And yet, when we're at Maundy Thursday service, we've already got our Easter outfits picked out. We're already planning on when we got to be back here Sunday morning because we know the end of that story. But the disciples didn't. They didn't know. They didn't understand. Jesus tried to tell them. They didn't get it. Surprise, surprise. So they're just sitting there on Saturday, just sad. And it was just allowed to be sad and no one rushed it. God could have done the whole resurrection thing in three seconds, but God didn't. And I appreciate that as someone who's dealt with pain and suffering, as many of us in the room have, if not all. I appreciate that there's just space for that and no one tried to rush them through it. Because to me, that's real and that's life. And maybe I don't have that sunshiny, I can just skip through the bad part mentality that Mark Batterson has. But I think I and maybe some of us in this room have something else. From verse 17, it says that if we're children of God, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If we share in his sufferings, I'm sure when Paul wrote this, he was talking about the way that Jesus died, the way he went so selflessly, the way he sacrificed himself for humanity. But when I read it, I'm, I'm reminded of all the times that Jesus suffered, even before the cross. Jesus suffered in John chapter 11, my personal favorite story in scripture, when Jesus hears that his friend Lazarus is sick and he's died. And Jesus goes to wake him up, he says. I'm going to go wake him up. I'm going to go raise him from the dead. It's going to be okay. And he gets there, and his friends take him to the tomb where Lazarus has been dead for four days. And even Jesus, knowing what he's going to do, he knows that the sunshine is coming. He doesn't get up in front of the crowd and say, God works all things for good. He doesn't do that. Jesus weeps at the tomb. He makes room for that suffering and that grief. To me, it is such an act of respect for ourselves and for humanity to allow space for grief. To me, your loss is worth that. Whatever you've lost in your life, a job, a marriage, a person, a dream, an idea of how you thought life would be, a worldview, a framework, parts of yourself, I think it is so dishonoring for us to even try to skip over that. You are worth more than that. Your story is worth more than that. What you have lost matters. And we see that Jesus himself makes space for that. When Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, he is so grieved by what he's about to do that his sweat becomes like drops of blood pouring out of his skin as he asks God, if there is any way out of this, give me it. And when Jesus is crucified and hanging on the cross in anguish, he doesn't shout out, our present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. He doesn't shout that out. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was not afraid to make space for pain, and all of this came before resurrection could come. My friends, what you have gone through, the injustice that we see in the world, the pain that we have experienced, to me, it is worth taking the time to grieve, to hold, to process, to truly share in Christ's suffering who did not ignore pain 
on his way to hope. I think we need, I think we owe it to ourselves to grieve what is on our way to the as if. Facing sadness and grief and doubt and pain does not, in my opinion, make you less of a Christian. To me, it makes you an honest one. And I think there is space for that in our journey. As we start to wrap up, there is a song that I love by a band called Johnny Swim. They're a really cute little husband and wife duo with a bunch of cute babies. And this song is called Let It Matter. I'm going to read you some of the words. It's not going to sound as cute as when I, when I say it as when they sing it. So you can go YouTube it later if you want to see how cute the song actually is. But I love these words. It says, I don't want to feel better. I don't want to feel good. I want to feel it hurt like losing someone should. I'm going to let my heart break. I'm going to let it burn. I'm going to stake my claim with the flame I know it hurled. Run, baby, run. Don't you know I've tried? But escape is a waste. Ain't no use in hiding. You know the best way over is through. So if it matters, let it matter. If your heart's breaking, let it ache. Catch those pieces as they scatter and know your hurt is not in vain. They say you know it ain't easy. I wouldn't want it to be. Because ease is for the shallow and we were from the deep. I don't want no distractions. Don't try to please me for one day. You are worth the joy, my love. You are worth the pain. If it matters, let it matter. Is there a big, beautiful, as if, future glory, sunshiny future out there? I sure hope so. I sure hope so. I believe, I'll believe that with you. I believe that our stories don't end in the dark. My, my faith tradition shows me that stories don't end in the dark, that there is always hope. I believe that. I do. And do I think that it takes time to grieve and process in order to get there? I do. I think your story and mine is worth taking the time to process and not skip over to try and get to the as if, but to take the time. You owe it to yourself. Your story isn't that important. You matter that much to let your pain be heard and be processed, to share in the suffering of Christ who wept at tombs and asked for a way out and showed us that we don't have to skip over the suffering to get to the glory. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm grateful for the example that you set in scripture, for the way that you show us that we don't have to be afraid of the darkness, that we don't have to be afraid of the suffering that we face. God, that we can hold the tension of suffering and hope that there's times where we might not have hope and that's okay, that you suffered as well, that we can follow your example and just allow ourselves to be human, to honor ourselves and our stories enough to just let our pain matter. God, I pray that you would get us to that as if future glory, sunshiny, beautiful place. I do. And God, I also think we can learn a lot about you and a lot about humanity as we wrestle with the what is. So God, I pray for both. I pray that we would have the courage and the vulnerability and the support to process our grief and then to reach for our hope. In Christ's name, amen. Maybe you've been in a place of wrestling with what is for a long time. And maybe you are ready to start reaching towards that as if future. If that's you, then pick up this chapter of scripture Think about that. Read this passage, this section from the author and start taking those steps toward that future hope. But if you're someone who has maybe struggled to stop and pause and allow yourself to grieve, maybe allow yourself to take some time to do that. Hold the what is and then reach for the as if. God bless you and go in peace. If you found this message meaningful, share it with others. 
To find more great episodes and stay up to date, subscribe to Another United Methodist Church's podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere you find your favorite podcast shows. In addition, subscribe to our channel on YouTube and find the community on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Anona Church. You can join us on our campus in Largo, Florida, and discover new ways to reach out to the Pinellas County community. Be a part of the Anona Church family as we worship, grow, serve, and live.